Well, it's certainly been a wonderful weekend. It's, you know, I was working this morning there by Carl and Francis home. There's a little um, canal. Beautiful. You know, I was like just enjoying the Lord and enjoying the privilege of being able to travel and minister to different churches. And it's a beautiful thing. You know, it's a beautiful church. And I was chatting to the Ignite team. And um, one of the, a couple of them said, hey, this is the best trip we've been on. <laughs> People have been saved, they've been worshipped, they've been taught. You know, for some of those kids, they, they, Clive took them to the game reserve. First time they've seen wild animals in the wild, you know. The other one, they, Giannis took them on the boat yesterday and in the river and they were like, they were just like, wow, it's amazing, you know. You know, when you give up your life for the king and the kingdom, your life becomes infinitely richer. Amen? You know, these kids have given a year of their life. And, uh, man, I've just, they're just getting enlarged, expanded, you know. One of the kids took Clive's car. I don't know, he took it through a bit of the bundu there, Clive. But what an experience, you know. Just amazing. You know? And, you know, I would love to just make a comment on the worship as well because it is a really special thing. And um, maybe there's some of us that are a little bit more reserved, you know. And that's fine. It doesn't matter if you are not excitable and all of that. What matters is what's going on in your heart. Do you understand? I mean, like, Mara and I are different, you know, and I'm quite emotionally expressive. And Mara is a little bit more reserved, but I tell you, in her heart, there's worship. In her heart, she's doing somersaults. In her heart, she's doing flick facts. And in her heart, she's enjoying the people that are doing it. She's not judging them. She's not... Does it make sense? That's the, in the kingdom, there's a freedom. Freedom to be who God made you to be. Amen? And there's a freedom like if you are that more reserved person, sometimes the Lord just says, Love loss. I remember watching the Springboks playing and then the World Cup and that Ian Wimmy, but Eleven. Flip, it's the middle of winter, but he runs outside, he jumps in his pool. <laughs> so, or dent like an Afrikaans man. Praise the hero. But what happens, man, he's just like his heart. Say, heart, they bust. He say, great, or say, forget. But you, you're allowed. To let your heart burst for the king. It doesn't matter what people think. Amen? But you don't have to. Does it make sense? There must be freedom. Wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and there's liberty. Amen? And you think, ah, oh, but the kids are, they're not into it. doesn't matter. At least there's freedom. At least they know they can be themselves. And you know, Jesus said, hey, don't suffer the little children to come unto me. Amen? I love what you said. The teacher knew. Yeah. <laughs> Ali Bokis neck, Bokis neckies. Am I right? But the kingdom of God is messy, bro. Am I right? It's messy, but it's wonderful. Father, as we look at your word this morning, as we um, come to, we haven't come to hear from a man. We've come to hear from the man. We've come to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ, the God man. You who were dead, but now is alive forevermore. Lord Jesus, we want to know the shepherd. We don't want to know about you, we don't want to know of you. We want to know you. And so Lord, we, just in, we know that you are here. We know that this church belongs to you. We know that we don't have to invite you. But in another sense, Lord, you stand at our doors of our hearts and you knock, wanting to be welcomed in, wanting to be led in. And Lord, the context of that was a church that you were outside and you were knocking. And so Lord, we hear your knock. And this morning we open our hearts and we say, Lord Jesus, you're the king of our hearts. And Lord, we need your help. 
I need your help this morning to preach your word. The, the hearers need your help to hear your word. So Lord, why don't you do that this morning? Empower me, empower them, Lord. And Lord, we want to take authority over every vain thought, every imagination, every distraction, every high thing that wants to exalt itself above the name of Jesus, that does not want to be dethroned. Lord, dethrone those things in our hearts that are not of you. And Lord, take your rightful place this morning on the throne of our life. Shake us like we heard in the prophetic words. Shake us, empty us, so that we can be filled. Break us so that we can release your fragrance of life. So Lord, we just submit ourselves to you, having rebuked the enemy and bound him in Jesus' name. We thank you for your blood that gives us access right into your throne room. And we ask for your mercy and your grace to receive the fullness of what you've planned for us this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I've been preaching through the parable of the lost sons. Are you with me? How many of you know that the headings in the Bible are not inspired? Yes? They were written after. Am I right? And it's the story, if you know, if you've, if you've got a Bible, we're looking at uh, Luke chapter 15, and in verse 11 you'll see the story. What is the heading in your Bible there in that story? Hey? The lost son. Someone else? The prodigal son. Someone else? Anyone else got a heading there that's different? And we've seen over this week, and I can't pre-preach what I've preached, so if you weren't here, you have to listen. Is that okay? But we know now that this is the story of the prodigal sons. Plural. Not singular. Yes? Because it's clear from the passage that both sons were lost. And again, I can't preach it all, but the preface to this passage is the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And we saw on Friday night that the lost sheep was lost out there in the world. And the shepherd had to go find him. And the story of the lost coin, we see that the coin was lost, but it was lost in the house. It was out of the person in the house. And there's, I'll read for John chapter 15, Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. And this is what it says. Now tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. And there's actually five parables in this set of teaching of Jesus. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost sons, the shrewd manager, and then Lazarus and the rich man. Which, is it a parable or is it a story that Jesus is telling as God about what happened when a rich oak and a, and a poor oak died? Because it doesn't seem to be a parable, but it's a story anyway. And they're all connected so there's two groups of people that are listening to Jesus. There's the tax collectors and the obvious sinners. They're coming to Jesus. Yes? And they're liking to listen to him. And when these other group of people, the religious people, the, the Pharisees and the teachers, all, when they see this happening, they like him. They see Rachi. And they're muttering, and they're complaining, and they're moaning. Then Jesus tells them all of these stories. And the, 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 the key story, I reckon one of the greatest stories in the Bible, I reckon if you understand this parable, the lost son parable, you understand the whole Bible. And if you miss the story, you miss the Bible. And you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to listen to Monday, Friday and Saturday. Amen? But there's actually in the story, there's three sons, there's three fathers, there's two kingdoms, and life, my friend, this is a revelation, gives you three options, not two. So the first son is the obvious son, he's the lost son, the younger son. Then there's the second son who's the older brother. Yes? 
And we're going to look at him today in great detail. Now, for those of you that were not here, I want to ask you a question. If you were here, I don't want you to answer. The last, the, there's two groups of people listening to Jesus. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the, the, the tax collectors and the sinners. There's two brothers, the older brother, the younger brother. And I'm taking for granted that you've got a bit of biblical knowledge. And then there's the lost sheep and the lost coin. Now, this, the younger brother, in the story, the younger brother, the scallop. Which of the two people, groups of people listening to Jesus do you think the younger brother represents? If you didn't, if you were not here, tell me what you think. The tax collectors and sinners. The younger brother is the obvious sinner. Now the older brother then, which of the two groups would he represent? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Yes? It's important to see that. Now, again, if you were here, don't answer me, but do you know that there would have been a third group of people listening to Jesus on that day? Telling the story. Who would have that third group been? Don't shout it out if you heard on Friday. I'm trying to get the people's attention that we're not here. Who would have the third group of people listening to Jesus been? Yes, sir. Of course, because they were following him, hey. The disciples. Now, if the Pharisees represent religion and the older brother, and if the tax collectors and the sinners represent the young brother, and let's call them worldly sinners. So you've got religious sinners, the Pharisees and the, tax, and the Sadducees. You've got worldly sinners. Then you've got the disciples. Yes? Now, if the, what would the disciples represent? They would represent the kingdom of God. Okay, and that, that leads us to the third son in the story, who's not mentioned, but he's obviously there. And that is Jesus, the perfect son of God, the son telling the story. See, Jesus many times says, in, go look at John 10, around there, he says this, hey, I'm from above, you're from below. I tell you what I've seen and heard in my Father's presence. You do what you see your Father do. My Father is God, your Father is the devil. The devil. That's what he tells them. The Father of lies. And so, this is the amazing revelation. There's two kingdoms in this world. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that Jesus represents, the kingdom that this church is represent, and then there's a kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of hell, the kingdom of sin. This kingdom brings life and life abundantly. This kingdom comes to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. Amen? But this kingdom, according to Jesus, and this parable, has got two manifestations, not one. The obvious manifestation of the kingdom of darkness is worldly sin. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work that out. But the way more dangerous, the way more deadly, the way more toxic, the way more hidden manifestation of that kingdom is religion. Because you have a form of godliness but you denied its power. You claim to know God but Jesus says in John chapter 8 verses 44, 42 to 44 to the religious, to the Jews he says you belong to your father the devil and you carry out your father's desires. And this offends the religious, big time. And that's the story, because we're going to read this now, and I want you to look at this story, again, if for homework, I hope you're going to read, I hope this inspires you to go and read the story, but in Luke chapter 20, verse 15, verse chapter 15, verse 20, we're going to read it, it says this, verse 25. So what happens is the younger brother comes home, 
The father's happy to see him. He celebrates. He kills a fatted calf. He gives him a robe. He gives him a ring. He puts sandals on his feet. They have a big party, like we were having this morning. We're having a big party. Are you with me? And let me just say this. If you were a little bit offended by the worship this morning, you might be an older brother. <laughs> just don't have to put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay? <laughs> Religious people get offended by extravagant acts of worship. All the time. All over the Bible. When King David was bringing the ark of God back into Jerusalem, and he was just so caught up in the moment, the presence of God was coming back into the capital city of God. And God's presence was going to be manifest there. He's so hot. He's, I mean, it's the Wustain, like here, yeah, you know. He gets all, he's missing to honor brook. Honor brook and, and hempy. On, well, your little vest. Yeah? And his wife looks out the window. She says she despises him in her heart. And then afterwards he comes home to bless his house. And she goes, My, the king has distinguished himself today in front of all the servant girls. You know the story? And he says, It was before the Lord that I danced, who chose me king above your father. He removed your father because your father didn't have a heart for God. And I was worshipping the Lord with all of my heart. And the Bible says that she was barren. She never, ever... Are you with me? And when, that, when Mary brings that alabaster jar and she breaks it at Jesus' feet. You know, you, I can, you go and see the story of Judas. That act of worship is what caused Jesus, Judas to betray Jesus. That extravagant act of worship. And Judas did not have a revelation as Jesus as the Son of God. He, when, he, when, when, he, he, when he betrayed him, he kissed him and he said, Rabbi. And then when he sends the money back after he feels bad, he says, I've betrayed the innocent man, not the Son of God. You see, Judas was with Jesus for three and a half years like the other 12 disciples. But he was blinded by religion and by religious sin. And he was stealing some of the money. And he never had the revelation that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so when he had sinned, and when he had fallen short of the religious standard, and we realized that he had been deceived, he cannot go for repentance and forgiveness of sin because he does not see that Jesus is the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world. He's still trusting in his own salvation, in his own ability to keep the law, and he dies in his sin because he was a religious sinner. Am I right? Jesus asked the disciples this question, who do the people say that I am, and who do you say that I am? And that is the most important question you can ask anyone, and anyone must answer. Who Jesus is, and what did he do? If you say Jesus was a good man, he was a prophet, he was a great teacher, he gave us some great food for thought, we should really consider the sayings of Jesus. We should do our best to keep them. You're dead in your sins. And you're lost. Not according to me, according to Jesus in this scripture. And if you say Jesus was God, Jesus was the Lamb of God who slain before the foundation of the world, Jesus existed before God sent him to earth to die on the cross, to be a propitiation for us. And propitiation is a gift that turns away wrath. When you've marked drug, when you bring home flowers and chocolates for your wife, that's propitiation. That's a, in a sense, it's a bribe, but God can't be bribed. Are you with me? And he can't bribe himself. But he, Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. God's wrath against our sin, God's anger against our sin, is turned away. Because Jesus was the substitute. And he died in your place for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the gospel. So now let's read this. Meanwhile, so that's what's happening with the younger brother. The younger brother, he's come home. He came to his senses and he had a revelation of his father, but he was still religious. But the father didn't treat him religiously. And, he, and we looked at that yesterday morning. And he brings him into the kingdom. 
And when the older brother sees this, just like those Pharisees, when they see these tax collectors and sinners, listen to this, watch this. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, and he heard the music, and he heard the dancing, like we heard the music and the dancing, and he called one of the servants and he asked him, I can imagine him going, what did David go on this? It's heaven. But to the religious, it sounds like hell. Because you're a son of hell and you don't know the difference between heaven and hell. Your brother has come home, they replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf for him because he has him back safe and sound. Whoa! It's amazing, isn't it? The older brother became angry. And he refused to go in. It's Wusman. Amazing. Why would you be angry? Your brother's come. Your dad's happy. Why would you be angry? So his father went out and pleaded with him. I smack him. And this is what you need to see, my friend. God loves people. God loves sinners. He loves tattooed, dacha working sinners. He loves them. He doesn't love their sin. He doesn't agree with their sin. He doesn't like their drinking. He doesn't like their smoking. He doesn't like their gambling. He doesn't like their sexual morality. But he loves them. And he catches them, then he cleans them. And he catches them. Fun, squid mark. Then they can come in. But he also loves religious people. Hulle is feil, man. Maar hulle weet nie. Hulle is stink. Maar hulle weet nie. Hulle harte is dood. Maar hulle weet nie. He's angry. En die die pa smekel. My son. But he answered his father. You can check his vein here on the side of his is popping. Take, look. All these years, I have been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders. And you never gave me a kid goat that I could celebrate with my friends. That's a slachter pa. That's a slachter man. That's, you are unfair. That's unrechtfertig. You, your problem is, you punish the good and you reward the guilty. What kind of a father are you? What kind of a God are you? But when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for it. Okay, as he speaks, I think he gets more, you know when you speak sometimes, you get more and more angry. They laugh when you're weird. It's like that. Yo! He just lets it all out there, man. At least he's being honest this time. Verse 31. My son, the father said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And boom! We don't know. Does the brother go in? Does he not go in? Does he sulk? Doesn't he sulk? Does he go and join the party? It's a cliffhanger. But we know that they killed Jesus. 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they killed Jesus. But we also know that Nicodemus gets saved. We know that Joseph of Arimathea is there. We know that God reaps people from the religion and he reaps people from the world and he brings them into his kingdom. You know, and that's, and that's where, look at this, it says here, verse 16, John chapter 16, verse 16, Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets have been proclaimed until John, that's John the Baptist, and since that time the good news of the kingdom has been preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. It's easier for heaven and earth apart from the least stroke of the pen of the law to drop. So Jesus is, Jesus is teaching, hey, I haven't come to do away with truth. Don't think that I'm preaching greasy grace here. There is truth. Jesus came full of grace, came full of truth. Just Jesus says, truth cannot save you. Well, truth can save you if you understand that Jesus is the way. He is the life and He is the truth. But the law on its own, apart from Jesus, that truth cannot save you. Because you will always fall short of the law. Amen? Now, I want to look at three ways in which the father invites the older brother into the kingdom. First thing the father says to him is look. Well, in the NLT, in the NLT version, so the, in the NLV, the, the older brother says to the father, look. In the NLT version, the father says to the son, look. Now I want to ask you, who's blind, the father or the son? The father is right. He's almost blind to the younger brother's sin because he doesn't hold it against him. But he's not blind to his sin. He's just forgiving it. Amen? And the older brother, he's not blind to the, old, the older brother's, the younger brother's sin, but he's blind to his own heart and his own motive. And if you read the rest of the story, the, the parable of the shrewd manager, it ends with Jesus saying to the Pharisees, it says, the Pharisees who love money heard this and they sneered at him. And Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. You either hate the one and love the other, or love the other one and be devoted to the other. He says, what, what is highly valued among men, which is money, is despicable in God's sight. If you put in a plate money and people, in God's economy, which one wins? Always people. Because, my friends, heaven is paid with gold paving bricks. God is not short of money. Do you know the easiest thing in the world is for God to give you money and bless you? The hardest thing in this world for God to do is get you to love people more than money. But the Bible says that if you seek first the kingdom and His righteousness and you'll love people, then... All those things will follow you. Amazing, hey? And that's the reason why, why if you ask, why is this older brother so angry? Who come and say to a busman? Do you know why? Because the idol of his heart is being touched. He loves money more than the father. He loves money more than the younger brother. And his, the, older, the younger brother was overtly a lover of money. He doesn't hide the fact. He just says, Lord, I, you know, he says to his dad, basically, I wish you were dead. You're not going to die anytime soon. So let's just cut to the chase. Give me my inheritance now. This is honest. The older brother, he's got a different strategy. He says, I'm going to outlast the father. And he's going to die. Then I'll inherit. But then the older brother messes with his plan. The younger brother messes with his plan because now he comes back. And now what does he see? Well, the family wealth was already halved. Now this idiot's back. And now he's going to halve it and he's going to waste the other half as well. And then there's my plan. Yes? So the father says to him, look, 
Because you are the one who's blind. I'm not blind, my boy. I can see your, old, your, your younger brother's heart. And I can see your heart. He doesn't say it, but the, the lesson is you as blind as your brother. You as lost as your brother. Yo, it's amazing, isn't it? So the father needs the older brother to see some things because religion blinds us. Matthew chapter 15, verses 12 to 14. John return there just says, leave them, Jesus says. They are blind guides. How the father invites the older brother into the kingdom. All right? What the older brother needs is to repent of religious sin and a works-based mentality. And he needs to repent of his love for money rather than people, his brother and his father. Jesus, speaking to religious Nicodemus, said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when John the Baptist and Jesus started their ministry, they said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we need to repent. You know, in Acts chapter 11, Cornelius, you know, the first, the first Gentile, the first younger brother to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit was Cornelius. Am I right? Now, he was a devout man, eh? He gave money to the poor. He fasted regularly. He prayed. He was a God-fearer. He built a synagogue for the Jews. But you know, when the angel appears to him, he says to him this, send to Joppa to a man named Simon the Tanner. There you'll feel a man named Peter. Listen, Salome, he will give you a message through which you and your whole household will be saved. Was he saved before? Was he worshipping God? The right God. Yes. Yes, he was serving the right God. But he wasn't saved. Because he didn't know the good shepherd. He knew about him, but he didn't know him. And Peter was going to introduce him to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. See, you have to be born again. The promise of the new covenant in the Old Testament is this. I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit inside of you. I'll take out your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And it's obvious to see the stony heart of the younger brother. It's not so obvious to see the stony heart of the religious brother. <coughs> Amazing, hey? Cornelius was a very good devout and religious man but he still needed salvation. He was blind and he was deaf. He had a hard heart. Three things that the brother, older brother did not understand. He did not understand his sonship. He did not understand his access to his father's presence. And he did not understand his access to his father's resources. First thing, the son says to him, my slave, I mean my son. Identity, sonship. He says, look, I have been slaving for you all of these years. What was his identity? A worker. A slave. A religious man. A religious slave. Just make a note of John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. Let me read that for you. John chapter, eight, John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. They asked Jesus... What must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And who did he send? Jesus. You want to know the work that God requires of you? Believe the gospel. That's not slavery. That's belief. And then John 8 verses 34 to 36. Listen to this. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Verse 35, now a slave has no permanent place in the family. Well, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son, Jesus the kingdom son, Jesus the son of God that came from heaven to earth, if that son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Set you free from religious sin. Set you free from worldly sin. Isn't that amazing? My son, not my slave. 
Do you know that Jesus won this right for us to be restored to our full positions and sons of God? John chapter 1, verses 11, verses 12 to 14. To those who received him, to those who accepted his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, Romans chapter 8, all of these things. Jesus is the perfect older brother. Although he was the author of salvation, he had to be made like the children. And though he was a son, he was perfected through suffering. In so doing, he became like the fallen sons that he was going to reap. It's amazing, isn't it? I want to show you, so he doesn't, the older brother, this is the thing, he doesn't have the father's heart. The problem with religion is you don't have the father's heart. You've got the father's law, the father's reals, and he said, heart me. You understand that? You know, Paul says this, he says, I know whom I've believed in. And I've been trusted to that day. I love what Myra said. The actor, he could know what Psalm 23 said. But he didn't know the shepherd from Psalm 23. See, religion, you know what the Bible says. But you don't know the heart of your father. Paul doesn't say, I know what I believe. He says, I know whom I believe. That's the difference between religion and relationship. Now I'm going to show you something. Who can quote for me John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish but have. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Hey? Now that's one, that's, one of the gospel. that's one part of the gospel. Let me show you the next part of the gospel. John, um, Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. So what, John chapter 3, 16 is salvation. It's mercy. God's forgiving grace. Did God have mercy on the younger brother? Huh? Did he treat him as his sins deserve? Does he mention his sin? No, because he knew he was a sinner. He'd already confessed it. So God just says, I love you, I forgive you, welcome. Verse 16, John, Matthew 3, 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and the Spirit of God descended him on like a dove. This part of the gospel is this. I must die. Baptism is an invitation to become like Jesus in his death. John 3.16, you see, Jesus was given so that you can be saved. Matthew 3.16 is, you must die. You must become Christ like him in his death so that you can experience his Life, what must you die to? If you're religious, you must die to your self-righteousness and your effort and your performance and your work. And if you're worldly, what must you die to? Your pleasure and your sin and your love of things other than God. And you must be baptized. Now my friends, let me tell you something. I was praying this morning when I walked. That you must be baptized groot doop nie, klein doop nie. But Baptism is a decision you make with your head and your heart. And no one can make that decision for you. You need to decide, I'm going to die. I'm going to be made like Christ in his death. Amen? Go to uh, Mark chapter 3 verse 16. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, James, so, uh, Andrew, Philip, these are the twelve apostles, right? Go back one verse. He appointed the twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, and have authority to drive out demons. The third part of the gospel is, once you see who Jesus is, once you join him in his death, then you see, hey man, he wants you to be a partner in his kingdom. He wants you to become a son like Jesus. And he has got work for you to do. But not religious work where you work for him. It's kingdom work where you join him. It says there, he called to those he wanted. Verse 13. They came to him. See, gospel, the, the salvation is a call. It's an invitation. God says, I want you. The father goes to the older brother. The father goes to the younger brother. He says, I want you. He calls him. But what must happen? You must come. 
they came to him. That they may be with him. Intimacy. You see, although the younger brother, the older, although the older brother was living with the father, he was not intimate with the father. He was lost in the house. And I said to them on Friday night, you know, often people keep their money in their bra there, close to their chest. That's the safe place. Am I right? Especially cash. The coins you keep here, but the, the notes you keep there. Intimacy. See, religion, you're in the house, but you're not in the heart. That they may be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. My friends, I'll tell you something. My friends, when your eyes of your heart are opened, and you understand forgiveness, you understand God became a man, so that man can become like God again. And all your sins are forgiven. And all of them have been washed away. And there is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be escaped from. If you truly understand that, and that this world, this net, it's, it's just the starter, it's the side dish, the main event is still to come. When you see that, my friend, your whole life, you don't have to be called to be a pastor, but your business will line up with the kingdom. Your family will line up with the kingdom. Your marriage will line up with the kingdom. Your church will line up with the kingdom. You just, you just realize there's one thing and only one thing to live for in this world, and that is the kingdom of God. And you are a representative and an ambassador of that kingdom. Isn't that amazing? And then the last one, Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I'm coming, whose sandals I'm not worthy to and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And this is the last part of the gospel. Once you understand that Jesus was God's lamb, that's John 3, 16. You need to be baptized and die. Then Jesus enlists you and invites you to become a partner in his kingdom. Guess what? The last part of the gospel is this. He gives you his spirit. He gives you his holy power. He gives you his divine power. Everything you need for life and godliness. God empowers you. My son, not my slave. You are always with me. You have proximity to the Father. And, listen to this. Everything I have is yours. This older brother, he did not have the Father's heart. He did not understand he was a son, and he did not have understand that he had access to the Father's resources. In Luke, 16, Luke 15 verse 12, the Bible says that when the younger brother came for his inheritance, the father took it, I need another Rusi, and he said to the younger brother, okay, now that you're not a younger brother, but I'm just giving it to you, okay? Did I say? Moi man. Older brother, did I say? The problem is that this guy takes it, but he puts it aside. He doesn't receive it. This one takes it, converts it to cash, and he wastes it all. <laughs> this one put it aside. He didn't understand the resources. Because he says to the father, You skarmankal! Jy het my nooit een van die bokies gegeen om te braai. What does the father say? It's your mouth. Ek het jy hele ding gegeen, man. Maar jy is stupid. Jy het hom nie gevat nie. Jy het nie geweet nie. Wat is jouna in Christus? The Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 3, verse 16, is the gift of the Father. Jesus says, I will send you a, another counselor to be with you for ever. Now, when it says another, what does that mean? You know, we can say, you know, you give your kid an ice cream and then you say, would you want another one? Now, that can mean another one like the one you just had or do you want another kind of ice cream? Am I right? A different one. Let me tell you, when Jesus says, I will send you another counselor. Do you know what he's saying? It's better that I go so that he can come. Because if I don't go, then he cannot come. I will send you another. He says, I will send you another counselor. 
another comforter just like me. But one difference. He won't be with you. He will be in you. Yes, I'm going to land. Now, my God, help me to get this across. The Holy Spirit is God. Is God. God lives in your heart. He gives you a new heart and He gives you a new geest. And that geest has access to all of God's resources. The fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Listen, whose fruits are they? Yours or the Holy Spirit? They're the Holy Spirit that you produce as you submit to Him. You don't produce them as you rest. One of the ladies in my church says, man, I work hard to produce the fruits of the Spirit and I never do. I said, that's because you're working hard. You're supposed to die. You're supposed to learn how to receive. But you're too busy working, you don't know how to receive because you're a slave and not a son. My son, everything I have is yours. Fruits of the Spirit. What about this? Gifts of the Spirit. All the gifts. Leadership for your business, for your marriage, for your children, for your school. For life, to lead the lost to Christ. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, healings, signs and wonders, prophecy, tongues, interpretation. Most of us don't operate in the gifts because we don't be broken. Hallelujah. Good luck, but you don't access the resource. What about, I've taught you all these things. What about the seven manifestations of the Spirit of God? Do you remember? The two trees, the throne of God, the Lamb of God, oil flows in, lampstand, seven manifestations, love, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, power, fear of the Lord. These are all yours. All the resources of the Father available to you. But because we don't know how to receive. Is this helpful? I want to tell you, my friends, I'm going to close with this last sort of teaching. It's going to take me about five minutes. Is that okay? Am I allowed, Mara? Thank you. I'm going to give you something, my friend, that's going to set you free. The world and religion were on earning and deserving. The kingdom of God works on giving and receiving. Alright? Now let me just get there. Help me, Jesus. I didn't plan to say this, but it's very important. I feel God's got it on me. So now I want to, I want to show it to you. It would help me to get the right one. John, check here. John chapter 17. Jesus, high priestly prayer. Right? He's about to go and he's about to die for them. And he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane. Look at verse 7. This is Jesus' prayer. Okay, we'll read from verse 6. I have revealed you to those that you gave me out of the world. So who did Jesus receive the 12 apostles from? And his disciples. The Father. He gave them to him. They were yours. You gave them to me. They have obeyed your words. Because he gave them God's word. Now watch out, verse 7. It's like this is the thing that needs, Jesus needed to get the, the 12 and the, all the disciples to understand. And now... They know. Dum, 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 dum. What do they know? 
that everything you have given me comes from you. Now they know that everything that I worked for, I worked for. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. You know what that does for you? John 3.27, John the Baptist. A man can only receive what is given him from above. One Corinthians, you foolish Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast like you didn't? Freely you have received, freely. Do you know how? One, do you know that you're a son and not a slave? Do you know that you have access to the Father's presence? Remember I taught you many years ago, come boldly and confidently to the throne room to receive mercy and find grace. Grace is empowering grace. The Holy Spirit is God's empowering grace to be what you're called to be and to do what you're called to do. You have to receive the Holy Spirit. The Hebrew says, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The parable of the talents. Did they start with nothing, have to work for it, and then have to produce more? No, what happened? They received first. Then they were supposed to work with the Father, double it, and then bring it back to him. And then he says, well done, my boy. You worked so well with me. I'm going to give you more. And the one lazy bugger, he just buried it. Now, God wasn't happy with that. So you see, there is work in the kingdom. But it's work with the Father, from His presence, with His resources, with His heart, overwhelmed in love with Him. And He says, hey, my boy, come son, man. Come. 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 Yeah, come on. Yes, sir. Say, <laughs> dwarf. He says, hey, my boy, I love you, man. I dig you, bro. <laughs> I've reconciled you in Christ Jesus. I paid for your sins. And you know what? Man, when I created you, I had good works that I planned in advance for you to do. Mm. With me, with my glory, how's about me and you for the rest of your life? Mm. We walk together into those good works. Mm. You receiving from me, me receiving from you, and you walking into the destiny that I have for you. Mm. That's a son, not a slave. Mm. That's walking in the plan that God has got for you. This is what the world wants. And this is what Jesus came to give us in this parable. Isn't this amazing? Are you receiving? Or are you earning and deserving? There's a tectonic plate shift today. I bet you most of you are saved. I don't think there's too many unsaved people here. If you are unsaved, get good news for you. Right now, today, you can be born again. But you can be saved and still be religious. That's my testimony. And you can be saved and still be worldly. That's also my testimony. <laughs> That's the bad testimony. But the good testimony is you can be saved and learn to walk with the Father. Be a son. Work with these things. God wants to empty you of worldliness. He wants to empty you of religion. And He wants you to come just as you are. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. And he says, man, I like empty vessels because I can put the oil of my joy, the oil of my kingdom, the oil of my life inside of you. 
And yes, yes, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, when G the Bible says that it was God's will to crush him. It was God's will to crush him. To make his life as a ransom for many. Amen? And yes, you'll come to Jesus. You will die. Your sin will die. Your religion will die. You will die. But guess what? My friends, when you die, unless a kernel of a deep dies, it remains a single kernel. But if it dies, if it dies, give me those. All of them. Alice, Alice, Alice. When you die to yourself, God just goes, Amen. Take the whole lot. I think I told you the story about eight years ago. My, my daughter Terry and I close with the story. She's about three years old. It's still the same story of giving and receiving, Mara. You know, I've got a packet of jelly beans like this. A packet of jelly beans like this. I give her two handfuls and she's got a mouthful. So she's sitting there in her hands. Where the packet behind my back. And I say, can I have some of your jelly beans, please? Now what's the difference between the ones in her hands and the ones in the packet? They're hers. But I gave her. But you know they're going to be more sweet for me. Because she doesn't have to give them to me. I don't need her jelly beans. Because I've got a whole packet. But what's going to make it sweet for me. If it comes from her heart. Sakrafara. Can I have some of your jelly beans? <laughs> Please can I have some of your jelly beans? <laughs> Eventually, she's like, yes, see, I took the jelly beans away. I bring that packet. The whole packet, I emptied out on the floor in front of her there. The floor was clean, don't worry. She eats that whole packet of jelly beans. You've received jelly beans from the Father. But now, dear Lelele, Oh, you'll fight. See, if you're a slave, you worked hard, you can't release them. But if you're a son and you know you received them, you can all deal, but you have yet the father had by a mere. Do you know how to receive? Do you know how to work with and not for? And do you have your father's heart? It's a special morning, eh? Let me tell you, this is not a condemnationary morning. That I did not tell these guys what to prophesy. You prophesied. Mm -hmm. It wasn't you. It was God inviting you. He's shifting plates in your lives to get your attention. He wants you emptied so you can be filled. Still got the rose smell in my hand so that you can smell like him. Who wants that? Why don't you stand to your feet if you want that? You know, I want to give you an opportunity this morning, my friend. You could have been living in the house your whole life, but you know today, I'm not born again. Some of you children, you grew up in your mom and dad's house, but today you've heard the gospel. I was nine years old when I gave my life to Jesus. You know that, and I got saved that day. I'd been going to church for nine years, but I got saved that day. Maybe some of you kids, you want to get saved, because now you're in the house, but now you want to be in the heart. Some of you teenagers. Or you could be an opa. And you've been in the house for 70 years. But today you've heard the gospel. And today you say, I want to be saved. I want to repent of my religion. Is there anyone here that for the first time today, you need to be born again? Why don't you put your hand up? No, don't be. It's not a shameful thing. That's the best thing you could do. Amen? It's not a shame to, to respond to Jesus. We all did. Amen? Anyone here? Put your hand for me. Wonderful. Now I hope all of you put up your hand for the next one, but you don't have to, but who of you, you know you're saved, but man, some of you need to be baptized. I'm telling you. Now I was, we went to Egypt and Israel and Jordan, 
Mar and I got baptized again. I didn't want to. I had a theological problem with being baptized again. The Holy Spirit said, I'm taking you to the next level. I want you to be baptized. I said, okay, yes, Lord. And now we're living in that next level. Amen. You need to be baptized if you are not baptized as, a, as an adult, understanding what you are doing. And then some of you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to receive the empowering grace of God through the person of the Holy Spirit coming on the inside of your heart. You need the full gospel. Some of you, you need to be commissioned into service in this church, into apostleship, into discipleship, so that you can be ambassadors for the King. If you know you need to respond to one of those invitations, why don't you lift your hands and I'm going to pray for you. Father, we thank you for the four Gospels. We thank you for the, th the four 316s. We thank you for the full Gospel. Yes. And Lord, this morning I want to pray in Jesus' name. Convince people, Lord, if they need to be baptized, to be baptized. Lord, for those that need to say yes to you and they need to enlist into the kingdom, and they need to make a step up, Father God, to discipleship or to leadership to, in your kingdom. A good work, not for you, Lord, but with you. Let them respond in Jesus' name. And then, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning and they need, either they need another infilling of your spirit, or another baptism, another infilling, or they need baptism in the Holy Spirit for the first time because they've heard Jesus and they believe the gospel, Right now, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would baptize River Flow Church in Jesus' name with the gift of the Father, the promise of the Father. Receive the Holy Spirit, River Flow Church, in Jesus' name. Shakarakata kitarakaya, rokoto shondo borokoya, rakatatata shekete kitarabashanda. Some of you need to learn how to receive. I want you to pray this, Father, I need to learn how your kingdom operates. Teach me how to die. Teach me how to be broken. Teach me how to freely give and freely receive. I want to be generous. Generous with my time. Generous with my service. Generous with my love generous with my finances. Thank you, Lord, that in your kingdom there is no lack. None. And deliver me from the love of money, from the love of possessions. I don't want to chase those things. I want them to chase me as I chase you. Help me to chase you and seek your kingdom. I ask in Jesus' name. Anyone sick this morning, I just want to pray for you. If you're sick this morning, touch your body. Now, I, I've, I went to Lourdes on uh, Friday and he loosened me up. I've got to go back to him. He's got to lay hands on me again. <laughs> but I want to pray for you. But my hands are on my back. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray for those that are sick this morning. Lord, your kingdom is not just one of speech, but of power. And Lord, I pray for the sick this morning, and I say, be healed in Jesus' name. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. I claim the blood of Jesus over you, and by his stripes, your sins have been forgiven, and you are healed in the name of Jesus. Heal them, Lord. Touch their bodies even now, Lord. Amen.